Thanks a lot. It's a huge honor speaking here at PyCon. So I'm actually a local here, so some of you guys probably will recognize my familiar accent. Um, but um, <clears throat> I'm very happy to bring another deep learning talk to Py PyCon Germany. And this time it's about really deep neural networks <clears throat> with PyTorch. So this talk, I hope, will be a little bit different than the talks uh, you've previously seen. So it's it's not like a beginner's, beginner's perspective of deep learning. It's more like, how would I, as a researcher, see deep learning? And how, how the heck do researchers come up with those very complicated network architectures? And I hope that my talk will help you solve that question. So it's a little bit about the, actually a new coming of age story. So what I'm trying to tell you guys today is um, something more like how did a simple neuron evolved into what we know today, like a very thousand layer huge monster. So just shortly hands up, um, how old do you think new networks are? Who thinks it's, it's like less than 20 years old, the technology? Who thinks it's less than 30 years old? Okay, less than 40 years old? Less than 50 years old? And less than 60 years old? So it's actually exactly 60 years. So um, it happened to be that the very first neuron ever proposed um, from a guy called Frank Rosenblatt um, in 1957, actually, uh, he designed this um, so this, this is not a figure from him, this is a figure from uh, Marvin Minsky and uh, Seymour Peppert, which, is, uh, which are two godfathers of AI, um, both recently deceased, unfortunately. Um, and they show like one of the very early representations of this perceptron from uh, Professor Rosenblatt. And um, it's, as you can see, the rates are in this very interesting waveform, and that's because it's actually designed to be a potential meter, so it's actually a machine and not a software. Um, it, those, those random connections on the uh, photocells is actually like real hardware wires. And Rosenblatt actually designed that perceptron to be built as a, as a huge computer. So that's a very interesting story. So um, Marvin Minsky and Pepper, then 1969, in a famous book called Perceptrons, criticized his invention, basically saying, this, this simple perceptron cannot, can only distinguish linear patterns and nothing else. And that actually caused the very first AI winter where everyone who worked on neural networks didn't got accepted in any conferences. So 1957, um, going up to 2015, which is like this thing happened to be come up, like ResNet 152, actually, there are resonates with more than a thousand layers, and my my story. I hopefully uh, try to uh, try to tell you a little bit more about how that small thing evolved into that huge thing. Um, so let's have a little bit spoiler alert or a little bit teaser ahead. So let's say our protagonist of this coming of age story, this little perceptron, um, tries to grow in depth, and as every young person in his life. He will figure out some serious issues, um, which will basically bore, uh, prevent him from getting deeper and getting, um, uh, gaining in depth, gaining in basically power. But thanks to, if you look at the x-axis time and some, some better soft, software and hardware, um, back in 2012, it starts to grow until it's like in 2015, with ResNet, a very smart idea came up which basically um, solved a lot of those serious problems it has in 1991. So um, just for you guys to know where we are at the talk right now. Um, of course, mandatory, what is deep learning? Um, I like to see deep learning and new networks simply uh, without any hype as a function approximator. Um, basically, there is actually a very a solid theory about um, 
multi-layer perceptrons being able to, with only a single hidden layer, approximate every um, continuous function given a finite number of, like, uh, of neurons. So it is basically a function approximator. You put something A in this neural network and something B comes up. And it could be any connection you want to have. For example, the most um, successful, of course, and most hyped one is the classification, image classification especially. Um, put Python in, get Python out. Um, one, one work we are working at, at my lab in Zurich um, is um, we are working on generative models, which are, for example, generative adversarial models, where you actually put something, an image in, and it generates something new out. So here you can see, for example, a blurry galaxy taken from a, a telescope, and we try to uh, basically resolve the noise, which is physically not possible to resolve, but using a new network, you might have a clearer view to the galaxy you want to observe. So this is, um, check that out, that's base ML. Um, so one, one thing which is also very cool, which I'm very passionate about is in classification, we can also use classification not only for e-marketing or for, for ImageNet, but also like for things like human cells where you can actually help a lot of biologists improve their track, research, uh, track discovery and biological research. Um, definitely highly recommend to also look at health applications for new networks. They are definitely changing right now the field. Um, Another really interesting thing which haven't been mentioned too, too much uh, during PyCon is reinforcement learning. So given an image of a street, for example, you want to teach a car to drive, um, of course you can, you, can, you can label that as a supervised classification problem, right? You have a street, um, left, right, straight, basically three categories, right? But the problem with a street is that every action you predict actually has consequences for the future. So meaning that you will never get in a, in, a, in a neural network a function approximator 100% certainty, 100% accuracy. So we'll always get a little bit noise. We'll always be a little bit off. And this little bit off will basically accumulate when you drive, right? Every time you get an image and you're a little bit off, you're a little bit off, you're a little bit off, you will get into data sets which the function has never seen before, and that's called catastrophic. Um, uh, that's basically bad because we'll crash into pedestrian. So. Um, Another way to train a new network is therefore to train it with reinforcement learning and uh, instead of um, rewarding the network every time it gets something right, you reward it every time it gets the whole path right. So uh, it should therefore concentrate to learn a policy. Um, very interesting work. Um, highly recommended to look into that too. Um, so let's get started with uh, this small network. Let's, let's go back in time. Not, not way back 1991, because that's where Python was just about, like, just in its, like, baby steps. Um, we will go, uh, we will assume to be in the perceptron age, but we will look at it uh, from the pure NumPy perspective, saying, like, okay, how would I implement a neural network if I have no automatic differentiation? Nothing, no TensorFlow, no, no PyTorch. Let's have a look. Um, um, is that visible from here? So, so um, simple setup. Um, first of all, we create a um, two-dimensional test data, like something which is not linearly separable. Okay, like simple, simple stuff. Um, some activation functions in NumPy. And now this is the interesting thing. So um, just for all the people who haven't seen like what, what a neural network training is, this is a short, very short and very um, rudimentary summary. Um, basically, we have uh, a model, and the model has weights W1, W2, W3. It's basically a three-layer network um, with biases. Um, so it's a very simple model. Um, X is the input. In this, in this case, a two-dimensional uh, coordinate of a point. Um, it will be, you calculate the dot product with, uh, with, the, with the first layer, with the first uh, rate matrix, and add a bias, and then an activation function here. And uh, just for simplicity, we take sigmoid, because it's one of the classic ones. Um, then you have the first hidden layer output. And basically, the next layer is just this hidden layer, again, with the other rate matrix.
uh, dot product bias add activation function. Uh, and then you basically do it the last time, you have the scores. Usually you calculate a softmax, um, uh, cross entropy telling how, how off the network was. And from that you, um, because we are in the non-automatic differentiation age, have to at that time calculate the backward force ourselves. So basically we, we remember how to differentiate, we do the chain rule, and basically from the, from the loss, uh, we will get, um, we'll get, get down and calculate all the gradients. So why do we need the gradients? We need the gradients to update the weights. So the gradient of a weight um, regarding to the loss is basically a very good indicator in which direction the network should go to improve the results. So because we calculate the gradient from a loss, uh, if you go in the other direction, basically trying to find a minimum, uh, it will, on average, make a better prediction next time as if we wouldn't have updated the gradients, uh, if we wouldn't have updated the weights, sorry. Um, yeah, and that's, that's basically it. That's, like, that's all the magic of deep learning, actually, uh, back in 19, that's, that's known since the 1980s. So let's, let's just run it. Let's, so I ran 10,000 iterations on it. Um, this is the first model, which is using SigMod as an activation function. Um, takes a little bit of time. So um, usually you expect a loss curve. The loss is an indicator how well your network is doing, right, after every iteration, to be very smooth. Like that's, people tell you deep learning is easy, deep learning is very easy to get into, but for specific examples, yes, but actually, if you want to see how people suffer with, with deep learning in, in practice, in, in research, uh, there is a, this really nice Tumblr blog called Loss Functions from Andrew Caparty, where he collects all the training iterations where it didn't happen to be like that smooth down, but has like this Python snake, or like this or oh. So every time it gets higher, it's actually worse. Um, and those are like real submissions from people suffered uh, during that time, yeah. So let's see if Accuracy, 33%. Let's train the uh, ReLU. So one thing you already can see maybe is here the loss decreases very slowly for sigmoid. The only thing I change here is the ReLU and it, will, it, it increases a lot. So it, it, it trains faster. And you can see that by the loss. It's not a guarantee that it's better uh, generalizing in the test set, but it is a good sign. Um, and also it feels like it trains faster. So in a second, we'll go into why that's the case, actually. Um, let's see if there's also better results. 92% accuracy. We can plot the predictions. So that's the, that's the space the SIGMOD neural network is uh, partitioning in the, our, our test data set. It's doing a pretty bad job. Um, and that's from just changing the activation function to reload. So, it's a pr pretty impressive difference, and let's have a look why that's the case. So how come a small change in the architecture activation function can actually change the prediction that, that much? Um, and one really nice thing to always, I recommend if you're doing deep learning research and you're stuck, always um, print out the gradients and the sum, the magnitude of, of the sum of the gradients uh, for each weight matrix. So you can see here, this is um, blue is for the first weight matrix layer and uh, orange for the second weight matrix layer. Um, the first one is, of course, more important because it's, if you think about hierarchy learning, it learns the important features first and then later everything builds up on the first layers. And you can see already a very interesting thing here, namely that the gradients uh, are actually lower than uh, in the second layer. So that's a bad sign because a gradient, the, the absolute value of a gradient tells you how fast it learns. Because remember the step we are taking, um, that's dependent on the learning rate and the gradient abs uh, absolute value. So if you have uh, only a tiny gradient, you just do a tiny step in this uh, in this space, and you probably didn't improve too much. So that's already one thing we can see. Let's let's print that out for a relu. Oh, nice! I couldn't submit that to the loss function in Tumblr actually. Um, you you can already see um, here. Uh, it's a much higher absolute value for the grains, although, sure, the second layer is still higher than the first layer. And if we plot both together, we can see that the sigmoids, basically, 
there's no green signal coming through. While for the ReLU, there's a lot. Um, let's have a look wh why that's the case. And that's actually the that's actually the antagonist I was talking about from this growing, uh, coming out of age story. Basically, it's called a vanishing, the vanishing gradient problem. It's a fundamental problem in deep learning. It tells you, it's basically the reason why those networks are really hard to train. Um, it turns out that if you do some math, um, I did it for you guys here. Um, if you calculate the gradients f from, for this simple, free, uh, neuron deep uh, neural network, um, the, the gradients of weight matrix one will depend on the one pre previously before, right? And if you calculate um, the derivative of the loss uh, f f uh, given the weight matrix one, you can actually see that um, this is the thing we plotted for the first layer. And this is the thing we plotted for the second layer. So how's the relationship between those two? And you can see actually that the problem is we usually initialize weights uh, in deep learning practice with a Gaussian between uh, with mean uh, zero and standard deviation. So this thing is usually smaller than, the weight matrix one is usually smaller than one. And the activation function, because the derivative of a sigmoid is actually maximum 0 0.25, this thing is smaller than one. So the problem is not that this thing is smaller than one, but the moment you get deeper, the whole thing ah, is a very small number. So you basically reduces uh, this gradient from the, t from the end layer up to the top vanishes, and that's called the vanishing gradient problem. Um, discovered in 1991 by a Munich master student uh, in his diploma thesis. Um, pretty, pretty cool stuff. Um, and that's, that's a fundamental problem. So let's, let's see how, why, why the ReLU can solve it better. Why does it have better gradient flow than the sigmoid? If you look at the sigmoid, the sigmoid activation function on the right top is this this squish, squishing S-shaped curve, right? So the, the derivative of it is maximum 0 0.25, as I said, at zero. While ReLU is this very stupid function of everything is zero and then it's linear. Um, but the derivative of a ReLU is actually a step function. And the step function has one here all the time. So basically that, that's, that's giving you a higher number to multiply and therefore gradient can flow much better. But still, it vanishes because if you randomly initialize a weight matrix, you can look at it as a random rotation in, in a space. Uh, a lot of, every time it gets through, a lot us gets set to zero, right? And so it also still vanishes. Um, anyway, a problem with that vanishing creating is that, first of all, different layers are learning in different speeds. So it's, um, it's a problem um, because it's instable. Um, especially because the first layers are learning, like they are critical to performance, right? We learn from deep learning, it's learning a hierarchical representation, and if the first layer is learning very slow, the other layers will suffer. Um, also, if we only trickle a little bit of the gradient, it takes probably ages until your network converges like you saw with the sigmoid. Um, so, we basically need something, some smart solution. So now our protagonist is in his deepest crisis, he's in the depression, what should he do? Luckily, there are some friends. So NumPy is great, but as you can see, it's, um, if, if the protagonist cannot learn that fast, uh, it needs better hardware, right? It needs to run it on something which is efficient, like a GPU. So we need to run our code somehow on the GPU. And another really, really bad thing is, oh, sorry. Another really, really bad thing is that um, every time I define this um, network, for example, here, because NumPy is not automatic differentiated, I need to calculate all the gradients. This is really, really annoying. So I wish there would be a framework with auto differentiation and GPU extensions. And hooray, um, PyTorch is one in a list of very, a lot of frameworks which followed after um, AlexNet's national success. Um, but PyTorch is very special for our Python community and I want to clarify why this is the case. So PyTorch itself is um, it's basically a framework which, which is exactly all the things which I asked for which the protagonist is asking for to, uh, to speed up his learning and his development. Um, it has three main uh, abstraction layers, the tensor, which is basically a, a, a GPU accelerated NumPy array. Um, you can really see it like this. I will show you a, in a short, a small comparison between NumPy and PyTorch. Then the variable, which is basically a node in the dynamic computational graph. And the dynamic computational graph helps us to automatically differentiate 
every computation, which is awesome. You don't have to calculate gradients anymore by hand. Um, and the model as last layer is basically something which is like TensorFlow's Keras or something convenient where you just write uh, like linear layer dense 300 neurons and done. It's doing all the stuff for you. So it has that too. So those three abstraction layers. Let's go and have a look at one of them. So then um, the GPU accelerated array tensor you can see on the left. This was the NumPy code I showed you. And on the right, this is basically the same code running, uh, able to run on the GPU in PyTorch. And it looks almost exactly the same, except for a little API change. But basically, the, 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 the Pythonic structure is preserved here. Um, you can also see that um, because we initialize with a data type, um, we can just simply change from CPU to GPU computation just by changing one line of code. B basically saying it's a CUDA flow tensor, not a, not a simple flow tensor. Um, also, every tensor you define um, has a dot .cuda method, which basically moves that CPU to the GPU for you. It's very, very simple. A simple call and done. It's actually that much intervened with NumPy that it has a NumPy bridge. So every time you open up, a, you create a, a PyTorch tensor, like here, uh, a, a five-dimensional array with ones, um, you can take dot .numpy and will convert it back to the NumPy representation because it's stored in internal NumPy representation editor and print that out. And if you actually change that NumPy representation or vice versa, change that torch, uh, PyTorch tensor representation, it will automatically influence the NumPy uh, array too. That's pretty cool. That helps you to analyze your network a lot. So give, for example, a simple use case would be the gradients, right? The weight matrix gradients. In TensorFlow, they are kind of hard to access, but here you can just copy them as a NumPy array, and then every time it runs an integration, stop and check it. Print out with matplotlib. Um, the variable. So one thing about computational crafts, um, every linear serialized um, program can be actually uh, represented as a, as a kind of computation graph. You see on the right, the one on the left, for example. Um, this is very useful, a very useful extraction, and many, all the major deep learning frameworks are using it, because at the moment you have this computational graph, you can calculate the gradient spec. You, you know from which node came which operation, you know the parent, and from that you can basically save and store and, um, um, and derive back the, the, the gradients. Also, it allows you to, to do parallelism. So the moment you have this abstract graph structure, you can split it up in machines and um, um, have the parameters, for example, in one, one machine and the, other, the, the graphs in the others and sync them together. Or this is called data parallelism. This is one major parallelism um, um, done in deep learning frameworks. Another one is called model parallelism. Imagine you have a 1,000 layers that won't fit in your 12 gigabyte GPU. Um, so you have to actually split it up in multiple machines. Um, and then you basically uh, cut it through in the middle of the graph instead of making copies of the graph. Um, so the special thing about PyTorch is it's building the graph dynamically. So let's say we have um, this program. We define the variables. Variable is basically telling PyTorch telling, you telling PyTorch you want the computation graph. So you do a variable. You initialize basically the nodes of the, uh, the least of the computation graph. And then every time you write a new line, it will on the fly uh, create that graph for you. That's very, so the moment you have that graph, you can just zero the gradients and just write loss dot, dot backwards from the end node and will calculate for every time you set like something called requires true, um, the, the, the gradients for each node. So it's actually a hypergraph. It has this, every, every variable has a link to another variable, which is the gradient. gradient. Um, and if you do backwards, it will basically calculate that for you. No need for writing that um, a little bit tedious NumPy uh, manual derivation. So the, the good thing about this is uh, there are dynamic computation graphs, but there are also static computation graphs. So static computation graphs, um, like TensorFlow or Piano actually build a graph at once. You probably use TensorFlow, some of you used it before, so you have to define a graph first. And then you run it. Um, you define it once, but you run it multiple times. Uh, in PyTorch, that's not the case. So every time you put that in a loop, 
this new graph will be constructed anew, 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 anew. But static graphs, however, you can optimize them, right? You, because you let Google know this is the graph you want to run. It can use all its engineer power to compile it and uh, reduce the mathematical operations into more efficient um, atomic operations. Um, but it's something which is not very Pythonic. So if, if you write TensorFlow, you have to imagine you want to write a, a, a condition, like just if, if, another, if, if a number is greater than zero, I want to multiply with this weight matrix instead of the other weight matrix. And because it's a static graph and it needs to know the graph beforehand, your computation, this condition is actually a computation node, a computation graph node. So you have to write this tf.con, basically, to tell TensorFlow you want this. While if you do PyTorch, because it's dynamic, it can leverage um, the, the logical conditional structure from Python itself, and simply everything you have to do is just use write as you would write your Python code. It's pretty awesome. Um, last thing I want to mention quickly is um, the modules. So this is basically the code with now the, the very convenient um, and syntactic sugar layer we used to. So, so be, instead of defining the math operations yourself, you basically define a model. Uh, you can define a model called sequential, which simply, as the name said, lets you stack layers sequentially in. Those layers are also like very simple, so you, you basically define dot .nn is one of the modules, um, put that in. You can then predict, the, just do a model call the model and you get the prediction, and you can just iterate through the parameters to do your update. Um, same with the loss function. There, uh, PyTorch provides a lot of implementations of loss function. You don't have to write the loss function yourself. It's actually smarter to use the PyTorch version because it's, um, it's bug, it's, so, so there are less bugs. Um, I, can, I can speak from, from experience, unfortunately. Um, and for example, this, this makes things actually very easy instead of remember calculating the softmax and then the cross entropy by yourself. Um, so can we now stack more layers with PyTorch uh, as our loyal friend helping us? Um, because now things are, we can speed things up, right? So we are now, if you think about the timeline, we are 2012, around that, 2013. We have fast software, we have GPU. Can we stack layers up? Can we go crazy? Um, no, not really. Although it's now possible to train networks uh, like, Alex, like AlexNet with eight layers or VGG with 16 to 19 layers, uh, the moment you stack them more up, so here's a small experiment done with convolutional layers. Um, so if you stack 20 convolutional layers uh, compared to 56 convolutional layers um, in a feed-forward fashion, actually something really interesting happens. And you can see that with the training error and the test error compared. So it's the higher, the more you get staggered up, the worse the performance. But not only in testing, but also in training. And this is strange because that means it's not overfitting. Because if it's overfitting, it would be like very, very good in training, um, but really bad in testing. Um, so this is not an overfitting problem. This is probably the vanishing gradient. This is an optimization problem for the 56 layer. Because in theory, uh, for training at least, the more layers you have should always be better than the less layers you have. Why is that the case? A simple concept, uh, constructual proof. So imagine you would basically take the less layers, take the weights, copy them to the higher network, and just the other layers are just simple identity functions, right? I mean, it learns any function. So that would be equal to the other network, right? So it should be at least um, the same. But it's not. And that means something, actually. That means maybe that feed-forward networks have a problem learning the identity. So imagine this. Every time it has a really good representation already, a very deep network, it now needs to, for the subsequent layers, learn a mapping that preserves the, the identity, right? the identity function itself. And the identity function itself is not random, so you have to set the weights exactly that they copy it to the next layers. Um, this is hard um, because you have to learn it from scratch. So one of the best ideas in recent years, um, 
probably, I, I argue it's one of the smartest ideas in deep learning uh, in 2015, was to simply add a, add a shortcut connection. So what that does is um, actually a lot. Um, the moment you get the XN, and you have the convolutional layers here, if you have a really good, um, if this is actually, so imagine you, you are here, down there, you already have a really good representation, right? You want to learn the identity function. All you now have to do is set this thing to zero. So you just have to make it not work, no gradient flowing through. While here, you have to learn, you have to somehow learn the whole representation from scratch. And here, you just have to learn f from x equals zero because you add the identity from the back up. That, if you do the math, um, also shows that it's very, very hard for those architectures to actually make gradients vanish because the gradient can always take the identity shortcut as, uh, as a last, last solution uh, thing. I promise you to show that code in, um, in, in PyTorch. So how would you implement that in PyTorch? Um, let's focus on here. It's actually very simple. So the convolutional and the, the network layers here are all with uh, NN module, but the only difference is just that you, the residual, you add that plus equal to the output, done. That's, that's the whole new idea um, I'm trying to, not new, but because it's already two years old, but that's the recently, the skip connection is the thing you should consider if you want to do really advanced networks. Um, and what does that actually allow you to do? Surprisingly, from eight layers to 19 layers, after coming up with the skip connection, you have up to actually 1,000 layers. But this is the network which actually won the, the ImageNet competition in 2015. It has 152 layers. Just, just thinking about that is crazy because we just saw how difficult it was to train like this free new networks, uh, free layer network with a sigma activation function, and now we can make it up to a thousand layers. And that's because the network can now decide to just cancel, cancel layers, right? It can decide to how deep it needs to be. Um, that also shows significant in the performance of uh, tasks such as image classification. You can see that uh, the accuracy is below human, um, the human baseline, and the layer numbers is still increasing. So a last very short notice is what's, what's next? So people thought if one skip layer is good, why not have skip layers for every layers from everywhere? Smart idea. <laughs> so that's what they did, DenseNet. It's called DenseNet. It's um, the winner of 2017's best CVPR paper. Um, and it's actually even providing more ways the gradient can flow through. Um, but there's a small difference to the original implementation from the Resil network. So it's not, just, uh, it's not just connecting to everywhere from anywhere. Um, it is actually not summing it up. So if you look at the forward pass, it's um, concatenating the, the, the outputs from the last layers. And that's because if you sum it up, you again, don't really have an identity. You, you, you mix it with the activation from the previous layers, but if you concatenate it, maybe the network can figure out what, which layer it should look at. It's even easier for, the, for checking out which layers are useful or not. So, yes, as a last slide, I want to say all the models I showed you with uh, the code is actually in PyTorch. You can just write from Torch Vision models and then download that, even pre-trained by ImageNet. So it's basically one single line of code. But I decided to show you that as a last slide because I, was, I hope you appreciate now how much thought actually was put into this kind of um, cute architecture um, which we re currently use in deep learning research. Um, that's my Twitter. Yeah, I will post the slides there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, David. So he finished before his time, so we even have, uh, we can have a larger session for Q&As. So any questions here? Oh, I see.
Yes, yeah, so thank you very much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I've been working a lot with TensorFlow, and I just recently heard or uh, talked about people when it comes to production that, um, of course, due to that static graphical representation in TensorFlow, TensorFlow is better for production, whereas uh, PyTorch is much better when it comes to experimenting and trying out things. Can you comment on that, or do you have some experience when it comes to the productive part? That's true. So, so the thing about dynamic graphs is that it's intervened with the code, right? It needs to know the, the logic of the code. If you do a condition statement, like if z bigger than zero, then do uh, multiply with the other rate matrix, then it needs to be inter intervened with the code. So every time you want to do PyTorch in production, you need to also deliver the code with it, which is not a very good way to do production. The good, better way is to serialize it like TensorFlow does, because all the necessary computation is stored in the graph structure. It can actually be completely without the code. It can be transferred in any and compiled in any uh, any language. So, for production, I would I would recommend TensorFlow. I would say. Next question. Uh, thanks for your great talk. I have one uh, this identity um, effect you explained. I found yes. that very interesting. I wasn't aware of that. And um, what does it mean in practice when you show you have like more than 200 layers, like in that one graph? You yep. could think about, okay, there's a gross number of layers and the net number of layers that are actually used during training. Could you elaborate on that? Very, very good question, sir. Um, it turns out that if you have a 1,000 layers, um, that's a study done by a friend of mine, um, and he, he figured out that actually 50% or more are, uh, of the layers are not really used. You can see that by a small experiment. So if you train the network and you randomly drop out layers, stochastic uh, drop out of the layers, the network actually regularizes and performs better. So this speaks against all we know about networks, right? new networks, because we think they are hierarchical. And every layer below depends on the layer. Um, every layer on top depends on the layer below. But it seems like you can just randomly delete at least the upper layers. And that speaks something for too much for, for the task. For example, if your task is just simple, used to be very hard, but now simple um, handwritten uh, digit recognition, then of course a thousand new network, a layer new network is totally overkill, and the new network will probably uh, has effective path length of maybe five or 10, 10 layers. So um, that's why one of the major ideas of DenseNet is actually to, because it's concatenating it and having a lot of connections, try to have a better feature reuse. Um, it turns out dense nets are not getting a thousand layers deep, but um, it's, it's smaller compression with more connection actually helps to have a more compact representation. Good question. Long way to go. Okay. Hello. Um, due, due to the smaller size of the dense net compared to the um, to the other shortcuts, uh, d does it al also drain faster or con converge faster? So um, the model size. When I say the model size is smaller, um, I mean sure. I mean the layers, uh, the number of layers, but I also mean the number of parameters. So it's it's smaller in uh, memory, so it can more probably fit it in a GPU. Um, so because it has less parameters, um, there's less computation to be done, but some of those computations are more, more expensive than a simple matrix multiplication because it's not just matrix multiplication, it's um, you're doing concatenation, you're doing actually also like um, dimensional reductions. Um, so I would, there's a, there's a nice graph, uh, there's a nice chart of how fast compared to the others, but unfortunately I don't have the numbers in my head. I'm sorry. Some more questions. Well, I have a question. How did you, mm, did you use DenseNet? Because, um, well, it looks like you can't do some distributed training for this because of this overall connections, everyone is connected. Everything is connected to the next layer and so on. 
So um, can you even train this on a distributed setting? Oh yes, you can. You can because um, if you distribute it, you cut it, so it's it has to be anyway synchronized over the machine. So it it will be basically transferred to the next. So if you, for example, it has if you have a, a feed forward network, right? Like let's say no skip connections, just uh, straight through. You still have to cut it at one piece, right? And then this connection has to be synchronized too. So with the denser, it's just more 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 points. You have to synchronize that. Thank you. So if there are no more questions, uh, please one applause for David again. Thanks a lot.